Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, senior attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation, Damian Schiff, and the host of uh, Word In Edgewise at KVMR in Nevada City, Thomas Wolf. Welcome to the show. We appreciate your uh, appearance. We're on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on uh, YouTube. We're on the web at uh, accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, uh, as well as cable channels all over the place, and, uh, and Facebook. Uh, CNN has filed a First Amendment lawsuit against the White House on the revocation of Jim Acosta's press pass. And uh, I, I, he had bad manners, but I, I'm just trying to figure out why his press pass was revoked in the first place and what the heck is the First Amendment issue right. involved here? Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it, the bad manners thing, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing about bad manners in, enshrined in the Constitution, but there is freedom of the press, and that is, that is a fundamental, uh, fundamental element of our political experiment here of the United States. And uh, uh, Napolitano, Judge Napolitano was on Fox recently. His opinion is that this is going to be resolved quickly uh, because he says basically the White House doesn't have a case. That you could revoke, foreseeably revoke a reporter's uh, credentials if that reporter posed some sort of threat to the president or to, the, to his family. There's no threat here. There's no danger. He's just an irritant because he asks, asks questions that Trump doesn't want to answer, and then he keeps asking them. And there was the whole incident where he wouldn't give up the microphone, and uh, and they had to speed up the film. And you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. They had to speed up the film to show to make it look like he was swatting her hand down. And it's probably going to pass quickly. Well, but what is the First Amendment argument? Do you have a uh, opinion on what the, what the actual First Amendment legal argument is? Well, I, I was. I mean, does a, does a, I guess does a press person have a right? to be a part of the, of the White House press pool. Well, exactly. I mean, that's, that, that's the interesting question. It, um, I mean, the president doesn't have the obligation to give press conferences. And even if he were to give a press conference, I don't think he has the obligation to, uh, to take questions. I mean, that can nat naturally be, be viewed as, um, as trying to, to avoid investigation. But, but it seems to me that, that so long as the reason for excluding a particular reporter is not based upon his viewpoint, mm -hmm. I would think that there may be a, a stronger case for simply decorum. So for example, under the First Amendment, and, and I haven't looked at, at, at the, the lawsuit that's been filed, but generally under the First Amendment, there are what you call time, place, and manner restrictions. Meaning that you might have an absolute First Amendment right to be able to, to, to speak your mind about politics in the public square, but the city can say, we don't want any demonstrations at midnight in the public parks. And that's permissible under the First Amendment. So uh, the White House might here say, look, we have an interest in maintaining decorum in uh, the White House during a press conference. And regardless of a, of a particular reporter's views, if that reporter acts in a way that, that, that is indecorous, then that is a reason to at least exclude it. Now, maybe CNN would say, well... Well, wait a minute. I mean, you, you're making an argument that the... The Trump, the Donald Trump, has uh, <laughs> has a uh, has a claim on decorum. <laughs> well, uh, uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Oh, okay. So, uh, but CNN might very well say, "Look, that might be a reason for asking Mr. Acosta to leave the room for a moment, or what have you." But, but is the is the penalty of uh, credential uh, uh, dismissal? Is that appropriate? And so I, that, that, that's a fair question. Well, not just anybody can get a, a White House press credential, right? I mean, you have to be, a, what, a bona fide no, news organization right. or something or another. I mean, there are certain, I, mean, I can't go to the press, to the White House and say, I am from Libertarian Counterpoint, I want a press credential. Well, have you tried the I haven't. Have I mean, but maybe, I'm guessing, maybe things have I'm guessing, I'm guessing that they would kind of laugh me out of the room. Well, the point being is that that's a classic time, place, manner restriction, is that is that uh, the courts would say it's, it's reasonable for the White House to, to limit access because it wants to maximize um, you know, uh, uh, the dissemination of its views and so it's going to pick the big networks and, like uh, CNN. Like, like CNN, for example. You but mean it, they're going to ignore the libertarian counterpoint audience? I mean, what, <laughs> what's up with that? What if you, what if you promise to throw softballs yeah, at Trump right. and just be a big Well, we, we can talk about the Libertarian Party's uh, success in one of the later um, yeah. uh, <laughs> elements. But, but I, I think bottom line is, yeah, uh, uh, there is, I think Judge Napolitano probably wasn't giving the, um, the best case for the White House because uh, 
you can limit speech even if there's no public danger. As I said, there's the public park example, for example, that you that the, a government doesn't have to allow people to use public spaces at any hour in any any way. But that would be content neutral. You're talking content about. neutral, right, right? And the question here is, is this press credential being revoked because the White House doesn't like what Acosta is saying? It's the obvious. And if that's it's true, obviously yeah. And, and if that's true, then uh, it's clearly unconstitutional. Really? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, interesting. Uh, uh, may I just, the, the quote, I remember, uh, Napolitano threw this one out, Jefferson's famous quote, I would rather have newspapers without government than government without newspapers. Uh, it, as if we had founded. that, I wish right. we had that actual right, choice. Right, right, but, right. Yeah. But I mean, well, they were, you know, they were in some, they had the choice at the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> they were with minimal yeah. government and yeah. then they lost control of that. Yeah. So. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal made an interesting ruling. Uh, if you get a marijuana card, I think it was in Nevada, uh, a Nevada person got a, a marijuana, a medical marijuana or a mm. recreational, I'm not sure which, card, uh, which you need to have in order to legally mm. buy marijuana in Nevada, right. legally under state law, still a federal law issue. <clears throat> the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal ruled that if you have a marijuana card, this person tried to get a firearms license, mm -hmm. tried to buy a firearm, For and was denied. Uh, because of the card, holding the card, what's that all about? Is that is that something that uh, you know? What's the what's the uh, the constitutional or the uh, legal justification for uh, for doing that? Well, the I courts, mean, my understanding is the people on marijuana are less prone to violence. Oh yeah, you than, don't than hear others. a lot of uh, the stone guys shooting up a school. That just doesn't happen. Well, and and, and that's that's one of the arguments that the, the counsel for the uh, for the lady who was applying for the. Uh, one of the purchase of the gun was arguing precisely that that there I that there isn't um, um, a rational basis or an, uh, an evidentiary basis for concluding that people who use medical marijuana are, are any more likely to commit uh, a crime than those who don't. Right. Now, uh, this case is part of a whole series of cases throughout the country that are trying to shake out what the Second Amendment means in light of the Supreme Court's decisions over the last decade or so that have held that, yes, in fact, the Second Amendment does protect an individual right to bear arms right. uh, that's not tied to membership in a, in a militia and that... Um, uh, the Heller decision. Right, exactly. Yeah. Heller and McDonald. Right. right. So the question, though, now is, under constitutional law generally, when you have fundamental rights, you have a certain level of scrutiny that courts apply. And usually that scrutiny is very strict and the government has a very hard time justifying itself. As it should. Some courts, though, I think are hoping that uh, the Second Amendment will be one of those rights that doesn't get as much judicial solicitude, and therefore the courts will... Sort of like commercial speech? Commercial speech is a great example, or uh, what, um, uh, what uh, economic liberty typically receives is a very minimal degree of scrutiny, and I think uh, those on the left in particular would, would appreciate that minimal degree of scrutiny being applied to Second Amendment cases. Here, uh, I, I think it's not outrageous what the Ninth Circuit concluded that um, that um, this is a three judge panel, right? Like three zero, yeah. concluding that um, that you know deferring to the government and 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 to I don't actually recall offhand whether it was a rational basis or something stronger. But the point being is it's not unusual for a court to say there's some evidence here that there's a connection between the narcotics use and and misbehavior with guns and therefore. It's reasonable for for the government to um, uh, to prevent their use. So even if, even if that's true, lumping marijuana use in with narcotics is it, we have the, we, enough of the science is in. We know that that isn't the case. Narcotics, I mean, the term gets used incorrectly anyway. Narcotics by narco means basically opioids and barbiturates. It has to be downers. But cocaine is considered a, a narcotic and speed and everything. Marijuana doesn't even. I don't see how you can make an argument based on uh, this person might be out of their mind uh, when you're talking about marijuana use. We know what marijuana does. There's been enough, enough tests, legal and, and quasi. We know that people don't, you don't hear road rage stories of people who've been smoking marijuana. It's usually people on caffeine, frank, frankly, if there's going to be any drug, maybe alcohol. Uh, but, you know, alcohol is far more responsible if you want to blame an inanimate object for violent acts, but nobody's talking about, oh, you occasionally drink, well, you don't get to have a gun. That doesn't, that's never gonna happen in this country, right? Well, you know, and, and, and that, that really highlights the, the scrutiny issue because uh, if you employ a high degree of judicial scrutiny, then that 
individualized analysis is appropriate. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you employ a low level of scrutiny, the courts will accept government basically stereotyping right. and, um, and uh, using broad generalizations that result in a lot of otherwise permissible activity being lumped together with, with, um, uh, with uh, improper behavior. Okay, so it's really a matter of what standard they're using and right. what the third, what this three judge panel is trying to do is use the most uh, lenient or the most uh, permissive standard as far as uh, letting uh, the the court letting the government have its way. It's certainly. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, I would be surprised if the court had applied strict scrutiny like the court would say apply in a typical First Amendment case right. because then. Uh, the government would have been required to present a great deal of, of, of justification for mm -hmm. for the, the important necessity of the ban. No, I think they should have to. But you were saying earlier that, it's, that in the case of economic freedom, they generally have a, have to present less. There's less scrutiny. Is this an economic issue? Would you consider this to be fall no, under economic well, freedom? I wouldn't consider it that way. But but that but that is exactly what the courts will do. Is they'll say, you don't even really need evidence. All you need is. A government uh, assertion. Fear. <laughs> to be able to conceive of a, of a rational basis for how yeah. someone in other could, words, could conclude In other words, make that. something up. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Well, and that it's no longer an empirical question. The empirical question then is resolved by the legislature, and really the only question for the courts is whether basically it was an illogical conclusion. Huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jamel Robertson, Robertson was a, a black security guard in uniform at yeah. Manny's Blue Room Lounge uh, I think that's in Illinois, uh, probably outside Chicago. I'm not sure exactly where it is. Anyway, he, there was a, there was an altercation in the bar. Uh, some drunken customers got ejected. Uh, had, got ejected. They came back with guns and, yeah. and were trying to shoot the bar up. He subdued them and was standing. Uh, I don't think he shot them, but he was, he subdued he them. Fired at. Uh, yeah, and then he, no, nobody died uh, until the police got there. Right. When the police got there, they shot the security guard. Right. The guy what's up? What's clearly up? marked security. Yeah. What's up? What, you know. What is up with that? Yeah, he was shouting security, as is what witnesses say. He, he was said, shouting I, security. He was shouting security. And, and the, security and the, was on his back. And security. the customers were shouting security. Yeah, right. And, uh, but it was a black man with a gun who had another man pinned to the ground. And a quick decision was made. I don't know, you know, this, this, this show will air in a week. Maybe more will come out between now and then. But uh, they, they, they're investigating it at this point. But nobody's on, you know, unpaid leave or anything like that. Uh, it's insane. This is supposed to be the good guy with the gun, right? That's the, that's the narrative. A bad guy with a gun is stopped by a good guy with a gun. Here was a good guy with a gun who got shot by the police, by another guy with a gun and a badge. I don't know where, where it fits in the narrative. I don't know what to make of this. It's, uh, it's depressing and uh, infuriating. That's well, what yeah. I say. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I have to Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Trump, the good guy, has uh, endorsed guy. easing mandatory sentencing laws. Yeah, well, and that's the first time you've heard that across my lips. I know I'm sure. Trump, the good guy. Uh, but, but in this case, he's endorsed easing mandatory sentencing laws. Good thing, right? It would stop clock. They say twice a day, it's right. And unless you're military time, then it's once a day, it's right. So yes, once and once in a while, he can be pressured. I think he, he's someone who. He goes with, I really believe this, he goes with the last thing that he heard, and if, he, if someone makes a case to him, someone, like I think it was Kim Kardashian, came and spoke to him about essentially this, you know, about uh, some prison reform, sentencing reform, and, um, you know, they've got that uh, reality TV connection, she's famous, he's, he swoons for fame. I think this might have been a factor, but yeah, he took the right position on this. I think we... It's long overdue. Sadly, it's not, as I understand, going to be retroactive, uh, which it should be. I mean, if we're talking about people in, in prison for you know, nonviolent offenses, but there's three of them, so they're in for life, right? But uh, yeah, he's on, I wanna give credit where credit is due. He's on the right side of this at the moment. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Any, any legal opinion on that, Damien? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you'll, you'll, ha you'll have a, a legal opinion on this. The FDA thinks it's a good idea to, to not only ban menthol cigarettes, but also to severely restrict the marketing of vape products, uh, products which are uh, ostensibly used to uh, get off of nicotine and, and cigarettes. Yeah, and th th this actually is um, uh, related to what we were discussing earlier about uh, the Ninth Circuit and marijuana cards and gun regulation, because 
you know, here you have uh, those who are arguing for more regulation of, of uh, vaping products and, and menthol cigarettes that uh, it's a, a great harm to children. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem, though, is that, is that you can grant that and, but still ask, why uh, are you but then... But can you really? But, no. but I'm saying, but if you, 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 let's grant that. But then the remedy that's being proposed is one that regulates far more than just simply ensuring right. that children don't have access to these uh, drugs or materials. It also then prevents adults from using right. it as well. And as you pointed out, some of these materials, some of these drugs are important uh, tools for weaning people off of more serious tobacco-related right. products. And that is one reason why the vaping industry has become uh, very popular, is because people who otherwise could not uh, kick the habit from much more injurious forms of, of tobacco mm -hmm. uh, have been able to do that through vaping and vaping devices. And yet the FDA is treating all of these things the same and basically employing the same regulatory approach. So that even if you grant the agency's argument and the activist's argument about harm to parts of the population, the remedy that's being prescribed seems to be um, excessive. And not just excessive in the sense of regulating more than necessary, but perhaps also creating more harm. Right, more actual health. Concern. More health harm. Decreasing right. the overall health. I mean, if, you're, if, you're talking, if the issue is the way they're marketed, that should be a separate thing from... We're talking about banning. Is it really trying to ban, ban menthol all cigarettes? cigarettes. Yes. That's insane. That's just because there's some additional flavor involved. That's an adult's choice to make. That is just a basic freedom thing. It's, we're Americans. This is not supposed to be any anybody else's business. If you want to restrict sales to under 18 or under 21 or whatever it is in the state, then you, you know if you really want to crack down, crack down on businesses that are illegally selling to underage purchasers. That's the issue. Don't crack down on everybody else because some kids might get a hold of it. That's it's, it's the same again rationale with, with say, gun laws, for example, the, or, or any other regulation that is uh, aimed at a particular harm, but then the government uses it far more broadly than mm -hmm. necessary. And uh, in subsequent shows, we can talk more about the vaping issue in particular. Sure. But this seems to me to be um, an example of... Um, of um, excessive do-goodism. Of course. Well, I, I, uh, uh, I'm not a smoker, uh, never have been. I, I, I'll admit, I smoke a cigarette every year, if I remember, on the Great American Smoke-Out Day as a protest. <laughs> I get dizzy and, <laughs> and, and I have a uh, stumble. But, but, uh, <laughs> what are you smoking? <laughs> A cigarette. Oh, yeah. okay, very good. Yeah, it's like yeah, a Marlboro yeah. extra light. Whatever, whatever. Somebody, <laughs> whatever down. I can buy for, from somebody for a quarter or 50 cents or whatever. Oh, oh you're not allowed to days. do that. That is illegal, sir, to well, buy I, single I broke, cigarettes. Okay, I, I broke that law, you too. You might get okay. choked out by uh, the You know, three felonies a day. And, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. And that's probably a misdemeanor, but whatever. Uh, there's a guy in, in New York that got, yeah. got uh, killed by the cops right, for, because for he was selling, selling what they called Lucy's. Onesies, yeah, Lucy's, yeah. Anyway, the thing I don't understand is this. Cigarettes are addicting, as I understand it, because of the nicotine. The nicotine is the addictive substance. Mm -hmm. right. Nicotine is not particularly uh, a health hazard it's in and of itself. Correct. Other than it's addictive. It has, some, it has some cool qualities, but mostly it's the burning and breathing and what smoke. Is, what, what's bad about yeah. smoking is the, you know, you're inhaling a bunch of uh, the tar, tar and the right. other tar right. and, and Which you don't have with, smoke with and vaping stuff. products or, yeah. And with, with vaping, Basically, you're inhaling a water vapor mm -hmm. that's, that's right. got flavor in it right. with nicotine. Mm -hmm. right. So you get your nicotine hit, you, you feed the addiction, but you do it without all of the right. harmful uh, ingredients that are in cigarettes. I think the activists would say that, um, and the FDA, I guess, would say as well, that um, these are gateway. Uh, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> gateway uh, drugs or, or gateway, they're gateways to uh, the, gateways, the worst gates things. Go, gates yeah. open in both directions. Right. So if the gateway opens to, hey, I, you know, this, is, this vaping is good. I think I'll try cigarettes. It also opens in the other direction. I'm smoking cigarettes. They make me cough, so I think I'll try vaping. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it opens in both directions. Well, and it, it, it also doesn't, doesn't um, undercut the point that even if it's a one-way gate, you can still employ methods to keep only certain people going right. through the gate that one-way one gate. You can put security in front of the gate. Right, right. You, don't, you don't need to shut the gate. 
well, you don't have you don't have to you don't have to lock the gate against everybody. Which is what FDA is proposing. They're, yeah, they're yeah. Pro okay. And, wh and what is it about menthol that makes menthol say that that's know. something different than <laughs> that I, supposedly I, I don't the know. fact that it has like a minty flavor uh, appeals to children? I was a child. I mean, I was a teenager when smoking was cool and smoking menthol. And you didn't, didn't you, did, you didn't think cools were cool. I, I mean, they did leave your mouth a little cooler taste. Yeah. Isn't menthol but also in, in, in cough drops and such? I guess yeah, yeah. yeah. start suppressing um, uh, cough drops. Only, well, if, only if they have codeine in them. If it's a gateway to harder okay. stuff, okay. you know. I mean. Okay, so what is it about the FDA? I mean, the FDA is obviously, to me, doing something that will probably have harmful long-term health benefits because it will make it more difficult for people to transfer off cigarettes using vaping to, you know, to, you know, quit, right. to quit. It's the already habit. happening. I, I yeah. know people. I mean, it's, you know, just. I, and, they're, and they're speculating that some kids will start with vaping and, 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 and go on to cigarettes, it. which is entirely speculation. There's no proof of that, well, as far as I know. It's very common with regulatory agencies that their charge is to regulate. So if they're not proposing new regulations, right. people believe that, oh, well, you're not necessary right <laughs> oh what would that what would that entail? and that that, that yeah. would be no more agency employment so. you have to justify your budget yeah that's, that's right basically i mean that's a real base kind of uh, argument but yeah you have to justify your budget so it has to be a new boogeyman well it's, it's not i mean it's not just uh, it's, not, it's not just tobacco and yeah. it's not exclusive to fda right. either but well, I, no. but i think that you, but you're the fda that al here. also is uh, arguing against life-saving drugs or potentially life-saving drugs mm -hmm for people who are terminal. They're saying, if you're terminal, yeah. you can't take this drug. Because it might kill you. Because it might kill you. Jeez. What, okay. I mean, where is it that this nanny state authoritarian streak on the part of bureaucrats comes from? Well, there has been some, I thought, uh, hasn't the Goldwater Institute been, been effective in the right to try legislation in, in various uh, well, states? Yeah, I think it's been moving but it's a forward struggle. on the yeah. state level, but the, but the FDA is fighting it tooth and right, nail. Right, of course. Right, right. Well, again, you know, I, I, I think uh, uh, it's also what we were talking about earlier about how the, the agencies will, will group problems together, aggregate the issue, and um, if you try and seek legal redress, the courts will say, well, you know, it's not really appropriate for us to pick out individual harms and say, oh, well, clear, cl clearly this person should have been ha given the right to try. Uh, the courts will just simply defer to the agency judgment categorically. Hmm. Okay, is that something that will change with a more uh, libertarian, conservative Supreme Court? Uh, the whole uh, idea of deferring to agencies the right to essentially uh, try cases? Well, it depends upon whether there's a slash when you said libertarian yeah, conservative. Right. <laughs> if it's libertarian and or conservative, then maybe not, because right. I think, unfortunately, in our legal culture, conservative legal thought has um, uh, been associated with Deference to, yeah. to government. Yeah, absolutely. That, yes. that that a conservative judiciary is one that doesn't really interfere doesn't rock with the up. operations of the political branches. And there is, a, a, there was a trace of that um, in the Supreme Court uh, as late as um, with J Justice Scalia, I think. Although even towards the end of his life, he was starting to change. I don't think you see it as much in somebody like Gorsuch, for example, Justice mm -hmm. Gorsuch, or even maybe Justice Kavanaugh. Certainly not with Justice Thomas. So there may be, yes, depending upon uh, future appointments. So you're saying Ka Kavanaugh and Gorsuch might be leaning more in the direction of taking away administrative authority? I certainly think that they don't view it as being uh, consistent with their philosophy mm -hmm. to defer in a knee-jerk fashion to what an administrative agency has dictated. Right. And you can see that in a lot of different ways in terms of the fights over whether legal interpretations from agencies should get any deference or just uh, from how much authority Congress should be allowed to delegate to agencies. They're skeptical of that. Uh, yeah, unelected, unelected agencies that are making massive decisions for everyone's lives. That does seem to go counter to, certainly counter to libertarian thought, and I would think even counter to consistent conservative thought, or what used to be called conservative thought. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, and, and uh, 30, 40 years ago, maybe not, but now I think there is a shift even in the conservative legal culture. Hmm. The United States government is set to spend more on interest than on, certainly the FDA, uh, but also more than on really expensive programs like Medicaid by 2020. Medicaid is, I, I'm not, I forget the exact percentage, but it's, it's a huge percentage of the, federal, of the federal budget. And with rising interest rates and obviously rising deficits, uh, as far as the eye can see, more money on, on interest, just interest on the debt, than on Medicaid yeah, by 2020 
and more money on interest than on defense yeah. <laughs> by the year 2023. Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I'm imagining. Is this just all sort of like make believe stuff? I mean, I'm imagining. You know, I mean, I'm imagining a bubble, floating around looking for a needle. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's. Where am I wrong? Well, uh, why? Maybe the government can just simply print more money and pay. Yeah. Well, they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's they're that's, that's they've been doing that <laughs> for uh, since 1913. Yeah. So, are you advocating for the return to the gold standard? I wouldn't be. I I, I would not advocate against that. Right. Right. Uh, some certainly. sort of standard. Uh, some sort of uh, yeah. Fine, any fine any standard, standard. Any standard other than uh, a, a dozen people or however many people are on the Federal Reserve Board who are essentially in the in the employ indirectly of the, of the banking system right. making up how much the federal, uh, how much, uh, what the money supply should be uh, on a whim, you know, what we think it should be, whatever, whatever. And I read recently that there's supposed to be, I believe there's supposed to be seven seats on that Federal Reserve and there's currently only three of them filled. Is, have you heard of this, anything? And I, I know that there's actually, some vacancies. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't tell you exactly what the number I mean, is. We're talking three people are making And that might be a good thing because uh, <laughs> Trump is actually, uh, in his most recent appointment of the Federal Reserve Chairman, mm -hmm. not a real good choice, as no. far as I can tell. Certainly no Paul Volcker, certainly right, no right. Uh, Milton Friedman, certainly not a, some, somebody who you would expect to bring a little bit of sanity to the... Wow. Uh, Do we have a the, Milton Friedman anymore? Is that even a thing anymore? Well, can we pull from and, and Friedman, you know, had his own problems with, sure. with uh, as far as monetary policy is concerned. He was, in fact, uh, in favor of some of the Federal Reserve um, uh, machinations. Um, mm -hmm. But... We, we have a system where <coughs> if you're in government, you can spend as much as you can raise in taxes, mm -hmm. plus you can spend as much as you, you can, can borrow with uh, borrow an uncollateralized uh, debt. And it's the uncollateralized part that, that causes the problem because basically the government can borrow whatever they damn well please, and that is enough to create a bubble. Now, the, the most recent bubble the bubble that we've been in since uh, 2009 mm -hmm. is an asset bubble. So it doesn't show up in inflation figures, it shows up in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Showing up in the stock market means that the 1%, not you, not me, right. but the rich 1%, yeah. they, they, yeah, they do very, very well, yeah. thank you very much, because their assets, you know, they be, are able to borrow money at 0%, invest it in the stock market, and see 20, 30% a year gains, or whatever, whatever it might turn out to be. Well, maybe the, the next political um, uh, slogan should be, we should all be in the 1%. <laughs> right. Lake will be gone. Everybody's <laughs> above average. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd go along with that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was a, wasn't I think Sasha Baron Cohen was doing a bit like that on his show. You know what I'm talking about? I swear to God, it's oh, exactly really? what you said. <laughs> As one of his characters, he was interviewing Barry uh, Sanders, and and he said, "Well, why don't we just uh, move well, we're we're all we're all in the one percent except for you and I, you, except, <laughs> except for you 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 and you because yeah, maybe you're in the two or three percent. I'm in the one percent. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> we're we're all equal except the pigs are more equal. Right. That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. That was Orwell. That was, uh, that Orwell, of course. Yeah. Uh, see you again next week on Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. <laughs>